people that I would like to thank for coming here. Uh, Dr. Karen Salmon, the State Superintendent of Schools, for coming to that. Thank you. We also have um, Superintendent of Queen Anne's County Public Schools, Dr. Andrea King. <laughs> Assistant Superintendent of Schools, Mr. Greg Kaluski. <laughs> we have the President of the Board of Education, Ms. Annette DiMaggio. <laughs> we have another board member, Ms. Carrie O'Connor. My name is Sid Pinder. I'm Director of Operations for Queen Anne's County Public Schools, and I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out. We have some law enforcement here. We have DES here. We have some volunteer fire departments. Um, before I turn this over, we've, we've done a lot of things in Queen Anne's County to improve school safety, and it's always changing. We're always looking at different ways. We're very fortunate to have our guest speaker here. We're one of three uh, schools in the entire state of Maryland to have our speaker and we're very thankful for that. So I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Dino Pignatero, who is the um, Assistant Executive Director of the Maryland Center for School Safety. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Um, that's on the trainer planning specialist. Thanks for pay raise. Sounded good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, first I apologize. Um, our timing got thrown off by the bridge being blocked. I work at the Maryland Center for School Safety. Well, right now we're a two-person operation, two and a half-person operation with our half-time uh, attorney general rep. July 1, the legislature made a big push, the governor, to um, increase school safety in the state. We made it right about the Safe to Learn Act. So hence, we'll be ramping up operations uh, very shortly. With that comes a lot of planning items have to be turned in. One of the things you may have heard about with school resource officers in every school, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's a, either a school resource officer assigned for an adequate response plan between your local high schools and your local law enforcement and public education uh, departments. So we're working with all of the Maryland Sheriff Association, Maryland Police Chief Association. Uh, my boss, Director of Dr. Ed Clark, is meeting with them again next week. Uh, to, 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 hammer out what is adequate staff and what adequate responses. So there's a lot coming forward. Um, we are very busy right now. I feel like the two of us are doing a lot of stuff. So if you have any school safety issues or questions, your school system, contact the local school system here, Sid, any of the others. They know how to get a hold of us and we'll try to be out as soon as we can to give you a hand with everything else. I want to thank, thank you, where are you working on? Okay, any uh, high tech gurus in here? Uh, I did spend two years in law enforcement, fire and rescue, and I did spend two years teaching high school before I took the current position. So all you folks in the back, feel free to move up. I know who all the educators are. All right, the cops and firemen I know better than I can. They're gonna stick right where they're at. And obviously my educators are too, thank you. So how do you want to While we're trying to get over this glitch, it's my honor to introduce to you Mr. Frank DeAngelis. Frank. Frank's a retired principal from Columbine High School. And with that, I've heard his presentation a half dozen times. I've never heard the same thing. There's always a little bit of something else I've learned. And your educators will tell you, walk away with something every time you listen to something. It enlightens you and brightens you. So uh, I will say, a couple times I've had tears in my eyes when you listen to it. Some of you will have it, some of you won't. But Frank will go into the events of that day and the events after and what led us to here today. We think we may have it figured out here. Anybody have any questions reference to school safety, school emergency planning while we're here at this time? No one? Yes, what is your organization and what do you do? Maryland Center for School Safety was stood up in 2012. The executive director was hired in 2013 with several mandates. Right now what we do is we assist all local school systems, public school systems, 
and any private partners that ask for any assistance when it comes to training the plan. We have offered stop the bleed training. I know Queens County is doing a lot of that right now uh, with their system. We do, uh, I, I do CPR, hard saver CPR for uh, school administrators and, and school staff. Um, the uh, center also reviews plans that are submitted to us for guidance on that. <clears throat> Trying to think what else. We, have, we host a, we bring together school resource officers, school administrators, and um, the public into a one group to uh, have a streamlined event, in fact, <coughs> planning and, and items like that. We do a two-day conference in mean, August, which is free for all your school resource officers, educators, and administrators, and psychologists who want you to come, you know, school people, personnel workers, to, uh, we bring in guests like Mr. DeAngelis from across the country, and uh, different topics, so there's something for everybody in that. Um, the center is located at the Maryland Coordination Analysis Center, that's the state's fusion center. There are 36 state safety school centers across the United States, 20 are with higher education institutions based in those. 15 are based in a law enforcement setting. We are the only one based in a state fusion center. And that works great because as information comes to us or comes through them, we get together right away and we can either cooperate or say it's not um, founded and that kind of stuff. So we get phone calls in the middle of the night from the fusion center on all kinds of issues. Any other questions? Now free. I don't tap dance, sorry. <laughs> I'm not made of uh, physique and that kind of stuff from that. Yes, ma'am. Gina, why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened in Great Mills and how we have been providing support to the Maryland Center for School Safety. Great Mills High School, March 20th, you all know the incident that happened down there. Uh, that morning we were notified we have a working relationship with all of the either the safety people or the public uh, the student service workers in all the, all 24 school districts. Uh, their security director, Mike Wyatt, got a hold of my executive director, Ed Clark. He texted me, and then we made a couple phone calls, and we, we headed down there. I was down there for eight days total, assisting them in their, their incident command center, their school safety command center. Um, that afternoon, with the help of Dr. Sammy's group and a group of other individuals around the state, we, we uh, stood up a uh, work group of uh, school psychologists and, and social workers to assist the students down there that <coughs> afternoon. Um, the reunification program down there plan worked as planned. I'm told the only glitch was 45 minutes when the feds got involved. And the local sheriff down there put a stop to that. Um, from, I think it was 10 o'clock that morning until 6 o'clock that night, they got all the students from that school reunited with their, their respective families. Um, since then, there's been a uh, federal grant, CERV grant, that's been applied for. Uh, it's pushing through. Um, the federal U.S. Department of Education has uh, just about said it's, it's theirs. So that will assist with ongoing um, counseling sessions for the students and the teachers that were involved and the families that were involved. Um, I can't get into much on what happened down there because I was privy to some things that I'm not allowed to talk about, but suffice it to say, uh, it could have been worse if the young man's mindset wasn't different. Okay. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I'm just here as a parent, but um, is there any advice for what parents can do? I just have one going in the middle school, so I'm kind of new to the situation. But. How many parents have children with smartphones? Oh, I want to see if there's more hands than that out here. All right. Look at their phones. Uh, it's not an invasion of privacy. They're yours till they're 18, and you're, you're footing the bill. It's that simple. Look at their phones. Turn their phones off at night. Make them charge. He had a great idea. He told me on the way up to the airport yesterday. 
make them put their phones on charge in your room at night. And so I'm going to bed at 9 o'clock. At 11.30, they're still in there. But yeah, be involved. You ready? No. No? <laughs> My pleasure to do yes. to you, Mr. Frank DeAngelis. Thank you. I've never had this happen, so I'm going to do my best. I'll do my best. I apologize, I'm not used to this. Cassie Bernal, Stephen Kernow, Corey DePooter, Kelly Fleming, Matt Hector, Daniel Mauser, Danny Rohrbach, Dave Sanders, Rachel Scott, Isaiah Scholes, John Tomlin, Lauren Townsend, Kyle Velasquez. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about 13 who lost their lives. And if you would have told me back almost over 19 years ago that a Columbine could have happened at Columbine, I would have said no. Because we were a community, and when I tell you about the profile of Columbine High School, you're going to be amazed. And when I do go to these other communities and talk, the first thing they said is your community is just like ours. And as a principal, I was never ready for what I experienced on that particular day. And I made a promise. I could not go back to my house that night because the, the police were concerned that they were still targeting me. So I ended up at my brother's house and I can remember lying in bed having no idea what I was going to tell the students and the staff and the rest of the people from our community. I wasn't sure what those words were going to entail, but I made a promise that as long as I can walk and talk, I'm going to go out and try to do the very best I can to stop some of these senseless acts of school violence. And I know people are going to say, well, Frank, you've been doing this for many years, but we hear about what's happened. I mean, just this year alone, January 23rd, Marshall County up in Bent, Kentucky, and then, of course, Parkland, we saw here at Great Mills. And we continue to hear about these school shootings, but what we don't hear about is how many have been stopped because of things we have in place now. And as I do my presentation, I think one of the things that you're going to realize is, boy, we are doing things differently that are saving lives. And so I think that's important for all of us. I'm a Colorado native. I've lived there all my life, and it's a great place, uh, 63 years of age. And they call it the Mile High City. It's kind of embarrassing because since they legalized marijuana, Mile High takes on a whole different <laughs> Feeling. And I tell people, if you ever come into our great state and someone offers you a brownie, you need to be careful. <laughs> I would probably drive on to Utah because you're not sure what you're going to get. And the thing that's so demoralizing for all of us is the way they helped pass that legislation is they said the taxes from the marijuana sales is going to go towards education. And we haven't seen the money. And it's unfortunate what we have seen is an increase in heroin being sold. We see an increase of drug dealers coming in and underselling people. So if they talk about doing something like that, they'll really look into it. It hasn't worked out the way that they sold it to the public. You know, I'm full-blooded Italian, and it's always interesting. I was at a conference, and I can't remember, I might have been in Canada, and some guy comes up and he says, he didn't even know my name, he didn't know who I was. He said, you're Italian. I said, well, how did you know that? He says, well, you're short, you got dark hair and dark eyes, and you talk with your hands. I said, well, thanks for profiling. He said, yeah. He said, I just finished watching The Godfather, and you could have started in that movie. And I said, well, thank you. But it was real interesting. He was getting ready to say, you know, I need a favor. He said, I'm getting ready to go to Italy with my family, and I need to learn to speak the language. And I said, well, my grandparents are from Sicily, but my dad's from New Jersey, and my mom's from Colorado. And I said, I don't speak the language. And he said, you need to say something to me in Italian so I don't look dumb when I get to Italy. And this guy's not leaving me alone. I'm walking in the hallway. He's right behind me. He said, are you ready to teach me? I realized I needed to come up with something pretty quickly. So I said, I want to make sure I have this correct. If I say something to you in a town, you're going to leave me alone the rest of the conference. And he said, I promise you. You have my word. So I said, shut up and get in the trunk. And he left me alone the rest of the conference. So we're in good shape. 
35 years at Columbine High School. And it was a great place. Even after everything happened, there wasn't a day that I did not want to walk into that school. And I was truly blessed to be a part of it. I wore many hats. I was an assistant football coach, head baseball coach. I taught social studies for 15 years, American history, and I taught some psychology. And in addition to that, I would later become dean of students. And then I was an assistant principal for a couple of years. And then I ended up taking over the principalship in 1996. I had an uncle, I'm not making his name up, Uncle Vito. And he said to me, he said, Frankie, at an early age, he said, choose a job you love, and you never have to work a day in your life. And he said, love what you do and do what you love. And it was the best decision that I ever made because when he told me that, and I kept thinking about it, and when I graduated from high school and I went to Metropolitan State College in Denver, I thought I wanted to be an accountant. Do we have any accountants in here? You guys do great work, you really do. But for me, my two years, when I was in school, I got through the first couple of years and I got cost accounting and something wasn't clicking. I wasn't passionate about it. And I thought back and I actually quit school and I went to work in a grocery store. And I said, this is not something I want to do for the rest of my life. And I said, I got to think about something that excites me. And I had a teacher, and I want you to remember this name, Chris Dittman, Mr. Dittman. He was my psychology teacher and he was my baseball coach. And I saw the impact that he had on kids and the difference that he made in their lives. And think about the people you work with, how many enjoy what they're doing. I actually had teachers that were marking off how many Mondays they had until they retired. And they would let me know saying, I only have 10 more Mondays and I'm out of here. Or I only have four more faculty meetings where I have to listen to you. And what was sad, is a lot of these people extended their wealth. They really enjoyed what they, do, they did, but the last four or five years, their passion was not in it. And I would be willing to bet if I returned to this school tomorrow or any of the schools in this area, and I walked into classrooms, I could probably tell within five minutes which teachers enjoy what they're doing. And I see students nodding their heads. Those are the teachers that you can't wait to get to their class. Never had problems. Had so many teachers saying, boy, we need tougher attendance policies, we need tougher policies on tardiness. The teachers that had those relationships, the passion about teaching, didn't need those rules because the kids were there and they wanted to be there. And for me, I was so fortunate from the standpoint that I never lost that passion for going to school each and every day. And when people were asking me after 35 years, they said, are you counting the days until you retire? I said, yes, I only have 10 more days, 15 more days with these kids. And people ask me now, what do I miss the most about not being involved in the schools? Now, I've been retired for four years. I miss the kids. And when I get an opportunity to go and present to classes or schools, that's what excites me. One of the things, not so much, was all the bureaucracy and things that got involved later in our lives. But I wasn't your typical principal, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Columbine High School, has anyone been to Little or Colorado? Great state. It really is. And Columbine High School is located in Littleton, Colorado. It's a school district, a very large school district, 85,000 students in Jefferson County. And there were 162 schools and they were spread out up north uh, to where I live now in the Arvada area, down to where Columbine is in the south area, and it goes up into the mountain area, Evergreen and Conifer. 23 high schools in Columbine did extremely well. They had a four-year graduation rate of over 94%, a dropout rate of less than 2%. We had 85 to 90% of our kids that went on to college each year. It was a school in which there's a lot of parental support. I think that I was one of the most, one of the things I was very proud of is we had 30 students or teachers at Columbine that were actually students of mine. And they, I either taught them, coached them, or they were students as a principal. So when they came back, they wanted to come to Columbine High School because there was that love and passion for the school. We had a lot of clubs and activities involved. Um, advanced placement classes, we had over 30 advanced placement classes. When I was there for five years, we had the International Baccalaureate Program. We sent many of our kids to top 
prestigious colleges, a Naval Academy, Air Force Academy. It was a great school. And we had over 30 clubs and activities. This was our band that had an opportunity to march at the Rose Day Parade back in 2002. Then April 20th, 1999 arrives. What I want to share with you, uh, what I was going to tell you a few minutes ago, is I wasn't your typical principal. I, wasn't a, I was not a principal that sat in my office. And a lot of times it would drive staff and it was crazy because they expect me to be in my office if they want to stop by. And I very politely said, if you need to see me, please set up an appointment. And it wasn't that I did not want to talk to them, but I wanted to be out in the hallways during passing period. I wanted to be in classes each and every day. I would spend an hour to two hours a day sitting in classes with the kids. I was one of the few high school principals that loved cafeteria because I actually got to go around and talk to the kids. And so I knew the kids, and they knew me. And they were always shocked because at the time of the Columbine tragedy, we had 2,000 students at our school, and I knew most of their names. And it made a difference when you could walk down the hall and all of a sudden you call a kid by his first name. It was all about those relationships, and that was so important to me. Well, on this day, April 20th, I did not start out at Columbine. I started out at a, it was actually at a golf course, and I wasn't playing golf, but we were at a diner or a clubhouse there, and we were giving certificates to some of our kids that were involved in the National Federal, or Future Business Leaders of America conference. And so I got to school late. And so I was sitting in my office, and a good friend of mine who was out here a couple of months ago, Kiki Label, was in my office. And he was getting ready. I was getting ready to offer him a job because he was a one-year teacher uh, and was not on a continuing contract. Well, we sat down, and before, and to this day, I still don't know if I offered him a contract, but he's still working at Columbine, so it was good. But as I sat in my office, getting ready to talk to Kiki, my secretary runs in and she said, Frank, there's been a report of gunfire. And the first thing that crosses my mind is this has to be a senior prank. This cannot be happening in this school. I have spent 20 years at Columbine. I can count on two hands the number of fights we had at Columbine. So when someone is telling me there's a report of gunfire, I was in disbelief until I ran out of my office, and I ran out of my office, and from here to the back of this auditorium, my worst nightmare became a reality, because I saw a gunman coming towards me. And I went through something that later I learned was fight, flight, and freeze. And everything slowed down. And all of a sudden, my sensory emotions started kicking in. There was a fire alarm going off. It was so loud that we could not carry on a conversation, but I was able to block that out. But I do remember the strobe lights, and everything slowed down. And as I saw the gunman approaching me, I remember a baseball cap turned backwards, a white baseball cap, and he had on a black vest, white t-shirt. And I remember looking down the barrel of the gun, and it looked like about the size of a cannon, about the size of a cannon. And all I kept thinking about is what it was going to feel like to have a bullet pierce my body. I had never in my entire life been in a situation like that. Well, things started happening, and I thought I walked down the hallway very calmly. But what Kiki stated is I ran right towards a gunfire. And when Kiki saw me a few hours later when we went out on the street, he was shocked because he thought, that I was dead because running right into the gunfire. And the reason I did that is there were some girls that were coming out of the locker room to go to a physical education class. There were anywhere from 20 to 25 girls coming out of the locker room, and they were unaware of what was happening. So they're in a state of panic. The gunman is coming towards us. Coming towards us. I go into the gymnasium area because I needed to get him into a safe place. But I also needed to get him out of the building. We couldn't go down the main hallway because that's where the gunmen were. Bombs were exploding, pipe bombs were exploding. And so I get ready to go into the gym, the door's locked. Then something, things started happening that I can't explain. I reach in my pocket, and that was a key ring I had on that day, 35 keys. I reached in my pocket, the first key I pulled out, I stuck in the door and opened the door. And I have tried that 
15 years after, and I was never able to do it. And it wasn't that it was especially marked key. It wasn't that it was larger. It was mixed in there. And that one key probably saved our life as we were trapped. Now, one of the most difficult things for me to deal with is what they call survivor's guilt. What I found out a couple of days later after talking to some of the investigators that were involved in the case of Columbine, Dave Sanders, who saw a picture of Dave, one of my dearest friends, attended his wedding, we celebrated our birthdays in the month of October. His daughter and my son went to school together at Columbine back in the 90s, early 90s. But what I found out is if Dave Sanders would have stayed in the faculty lounge on that morning of April 20th, I wouldn't be standing here. As he ran up the hallway to uh, get kids to a safe place, and as a gunman was coming towards me, they spotted Dave and they stopped temporarily, turned around and they shot him in the back of the head. And one of the most difficult things for me on that day, or actually a few days later when the FBI brought me into the building to see the damage that had been done, is when I walked down the hallway, I saw the knuckle prints where Dave just pushed himself down the hallway until the teacher dragged him into the classroom. And that was very difficult for me knowing that if it wasn't for Dave, I probably would not be standing here. It was a war zone, and when I uh, present at conferences, SRO conferences, or police conferences, and firefighter conferences, people are amazed. Because on this day, we had a protocol in place. It was called Secure the Perimeter. And basically what that meant is we had a school resource officer that was actually exchanging gunfire with the two gunmen. But he was informed he could not go into the building until the SWAT team arrived. And they secured. Unfortunately, by the time the SWAT team got on campus, it was 50 minutes. And during that 50 minutes, we lost 13 students and 26 were injured. And I truly believe that the protocol that we have in place now, and it's even changed some since Columbine now, they would wait until two or three officers came on site. Well, now the first officer on site is going in and they're engaging with the assailant. So there are things, lessons learned from Columbine. But on that day, it was so frustrating because dispatchers were telling kids, and you need to understand, prior to that time, the only girls that we did were fire girls. And how many kids have lost lives or teachers have lost lives in school fire? But we didn't have any of these things like you have now, run, hide, and fight, or lock down, lock out, and things of that nature. And so when people were calling on their cell phones, we had very limited cell phone service, the dispatchers from the law enforcement agencies were telling people, help is on the way, don't go anywhere. And one of the most frustrating things for the students and staff members is they were looking outside, we're a two-story building, they were looking outside, saying help was on the way, and there were all kinds of police officers standing outside, not coming into the building. And it wasn't that they were not doing their job. They were frustrated, and they were gonna break rank to go into that building. But they had to wait until SWAT arrived. Now, one of the things that's real interesting is these two killers at Columbine did not wake up on April 20th and said, I'm having a bad day, we're having a bad day, let's go book, or let's go take care of the students at our school. It's a plan that they had devised over a year. And the sad thing, and this is for parents, the sad thing is you need to be involved in your kids' lives. Because these two were plotting their plan in their parents' basement for over a year. They were down there videotaping, they had a camera just like the one that's pointing at me, and they were talking about everything that they were going to do. They were drinking Jack Daniels, they had rifles, preparing for this plot, and they said, we're, gonna, we're not gonna do what those people did at Pearl, Mississippi, or Jonesboro, or Paducah. We're gonna do it right. And they had a plan, they brought two propane tanks into the cafeteria, and they knew when the kids would be in the cafeteria along with staff, we had about 600 people in the cafeteria. And so they had such a devised plan that they set off a pipe bomb about six blocks away from Columbine. Some police officers went up there. The bombs were going to go off in the high school. 
And then they were going to stand outside and shoot kids and staff members as they ran out. And they even had their cars wired to explode because they knew exactly where the first responders were going to park or they would be coming into the building. And the sad thing about it is they showed videotapes of everything in their basement. And these two had fuse wire on the wall. One kid had a rifle and he put it in his duffel bag and his mom said, what is that? And he told his mother, it's a plot for the school play, or a prop for the school play. He, his dad found a pipe bomb and his dad said, you better never do this again or we're gonna ground you. <laughs> Two months before, they call up and they said, Mr. Harris, all your ammunition is in for April 20th. And the dad said, I'm sorry, you got the wrong number. Now as a parent, if you start seeing all these signs, you would think maybe I need to step in. And when the police arrived at the Harris's home on April 20th, the first thing the mother said to the police officers, you cannot go into his room, no one has ever been in his room. So I truly believe that if these parents would have been involved, we may not be talking about Columbine. Because there was a hit list that was posted about two months before that one of the parents called the police and for whatever reason, they felt they did not have enough information to do a search warrant. But they actually talked about their plan. And so these parents, and these were, I think the myth out there is when you hear about Columbine, you think about these at-risk kids. That was the furthest thing from the truth. These were kids that were in advanced placement classes. These were kids that were in gifted and talented. As a matter of fact, it was a month before, the Klebold family drove to the University of Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, to go visit the campus because he had just got accepted. So they had everyone pulled. They, they were psychopathic, especially Harris was a psychopathic killer. And you saw the videotapes that he made and he idolized Adolf Hitler. And he felt that people deserved to die if they were weak individuals. And he talked about that. And it reminded me from teaching history of just hearing some of the speeches that were given by Adolf Hitler. The other, Klebold was more of a, he was depressed, and his mother just, within the past year, came out with a book, and the thing that she regrets the most is she said when he became a senior in high school, she felt she needed to leave him alone because he was a young adult. And she said it was probably the biggest mistake she ever made because he was crying out for help, and she never gave it to him. You can see the cafeteria in the two pipe bomb, or excuse me, the two propane tanks did not explode. And the thing that's scary is they learned how to build these bombs on the internet. So as parents, the school officials, here's a teaching moment. If you have kids or students in here, if you have friends that are infatuated with Columbine High School, you need to alert someone. That's a red flag. Because there have been 74 instances since Columbine, this was 19 years ago, that potential shooters in schools made reference to Columbine. There have been five students that actually visited the campus at Columbine before they actually went to their school to perform a school shooting. And they came to Columbine in order to be motivated. So that's a red flag. And what scares us today is kids in high school now were not even born when Columbine was taking place. We had a situation up here in Frederick, Maryland, where a young lady was planning a Columbine-like attack. And fortunately, her dad turned her in. And he got criticized because I knew someone from Frederick that I did a presentation, said, Frank, you're not going to believe this. And the father they were really vilifying him for turning his daughter. He probably, well, he did. He saved his daughter's life and who knows how many other lives. So when parents, it always bothers me when parents used to call up and tell me, Frank, can you tell my daughter she can't wear that to school? And I said, you're the parent. And they said, Frank, they may not like me. And I said, that's not an issue. You need to be their parent. One of the most difficult I apologize, this is not my normal presentation. Okay, this is good. I mean, this is not good, but I'm glad I found the slide. Once I got the girls inside the gymnasium, 
I wanted to go outside to make sure it was safe because I did not want them to be in the building. And so as I got outside, I stuck my head out, and here comes all the Jefferson County police officers, Lakewood police officers, and they said, go on in and get them out, we'll cover for you. I went outside and they said, no one's going back in that building until SWAT arrives. So took the girls, we went over to Clement Park, and that's where all the stations, or all the law enforcement agents and paramedics were stationed. And on that day, they actually brought a grease board out, and I was working with all the different law enforcement agencies who had arrived, and they were getting ready for SWAT to come on campus. And they were planning their attack. They needed to get in the building where the science wing was located, because we had about 300 kids and staff members trapped in that area. And I could remember, as they bring a grease board out, and they said, Frank, we need for you to draw the schematics of the school. We need to know how the ventilation system runs in the school. I couldn't even remember the numbers on classrooms, and they're planning their attack on the drawings. And at one point, I told you about the loudness of the fire alarm. They said, Frank, I know this is asking a lot, but would you be willing to put on body armor to go into the building to shut off the fire alarm? Now, this was a little over 19 years. Now, you look at what you have in place here, and I know Dino can answer this question, or I know we have some police officers here that can answer the question, but I would be willing to bet that every school plan is on a computer that they have access to. And they could probably disable alarms. So things have changed for the better. Well, one of the most difficult things for me that evening is once I left the Columbine area, I went down to Leewood Elementary School, and that was a place, it was a reunification center. It's something I was never prepared for. So we had one of my assistant principal who was up on stage, and they were actually taking kids from Columbine, interviewing them, putting them on buses, and then taking them down to Leewood, and they would be reunited with their parents. Well, needless to say, it was very, very much uh, emotional. As time went on, there were fewer families in the gymnasium area, or the little auditorium area at the elementary school. And I, I knew most of the parents because I had been there for 20 years, and there were parents coming up saying, Frank, did you see my son? He was in math class fifth hour. Did you see my daughter? And I had not. And then there was a father who went and stuck his head outside and he said, Frank, there's no more yellow buses. What's going on? And that's when a grief counselor came over to me and said, Frank, we need to get these parents. We need to take them into another room, and you need to tell them there's a good chance that their child lost their life in their school. And that was something I was never prepared for. And finding the words to break that news. And sometimes you just can't find the words. And it was amazing when the first shots were fired, the people that started arriving, in addition to law enforcement, in addition to paramedics, we had media. We had helicopters hovering over. But guess who else showed up? Attorneys. Right away. Trying to contact people. We had an attorney from our school district before I went into that room to tell the parents and the grief counselor in the corner was going to tell them they need to go home and get dental records. The attorney pulled me aside and he said, Frank, you better be careful talking to those parents because there's a potential lawsuit. That was the last thing on my mind. And I, you know, I thought, you know, I, I owe so much to my parents. They taught me that you need to stand up for what is right, even though you're standing alone at times. And I went and met with those parents on that horrific evening. But then over the weekend, I went to visit each of those parents just to offer my condolences. And it was about a month later, it was Mother's Day, and again, the attorneys were saying, Frank, you better be careful. I did not listen. And I went and bought flowers and took them to all the moms on Mother's Day. And those were tough visits. But I had to think that on this Mother's Day, they're missing one of their children. But I would do it over again. It was the right thing to do. And even 19 years later, I have called these parents on their kid's birthday. Because I made them a promise when I went to each and every one of their houses that I would never forget those kids. And right now, they would be 36-year-old adults. And on April 20th, I called them to tell them I'm thinking of them. 
It was all about those relationships. I've really been busy this school year dealing with other schools. Uh, Patricia Greer from Grand Marshall or Marshall County. Uh, Ty Thompson, the principal at Parkland. And Jake, I'll be meeting with him, the principal. Dr. Jake, the principal, is it Heibel? Yeah. I'll be meeting with him this week to just talk about the aftermath. And the first thing that I tell each and every one of them, it's a marathon and not a sprint. If people want to know when it gets back to normal, it doesn't. You have to redefine what normal is. And that's what we had to do. And one of the things that I would recommend to anyone that is making decisions on recovery is you have to plan ahead. Because that first year, there is so much support for people and there's people coming in. It's very similar in our own lives that we lose a loved one. Just recently lost a dear friend of the family. And all of a sudden you have family members that are flying in, you have people bringing food, you have people there for support. But what happens when they go home? That hurt is still there. And that's what I'm telling people. And what we learned is they really felt that if people were going to get help, they needed to get it within the three-year period afterwards because that's when the last class would graduate. What we found out is not everyone is in the same place. If we all experienced some major event in our life, we would all deal with it differently. And what I worry about are students that seem to be doing fairly well, but five years out, seven years out, something happens in their life and they're traumatized and there's no help for them. So in planning ahead, it's important that you can see what may happen in the future and have that support. It's real interesting, I've been working, I was working with Sandy Hook, and the kids that were in the elementary school that day actually are freshmen now in high school. And I can remember getting a phone call, and I, I'm not sure if it was a superintendent who called and said, Frank, I don't know if this is important or not, but you think we should talk to the high school teachers about this class coming in? And I said, yes, you better. Because what we learned about is we had to change curriculum. These kids were re-traumatized when a fire alarm went off. And if the staff is not prepared for that, it could really create issues and cause more harm than good. So I think it's a marathon and not a sprint. And one of the things that I noticed over the years is every time we seem to be moving ahead and making some headway, something would happen. It was six months after the tragedy, six months and two days, we had four students that were critically injured at the 26th. Anne-Marie Hallcoulter, Patrick Ireland, who signed the films of Columbine, he was a boy in the window lowering himself down. We had Richard Castaldo and we had Sean Graves. Well, Anne-Marie was not attending Columbine, she was being homeschooled because she was still recovering, but her brother Nathan was at Columbine, he was a freshman. I think it was October 22nd, a police officer comes in and says, Frank, we need to talk. And I said, okay. And he said, no, we need to talk in your office, which is never good. And he said, Frank, you need to go get Nathan. And I said, what's going on? He said, well, Anne Marie and Nathan's mom went into a pawn shop in Inglewood, Colorado, had a gun, bought some ammunition, took her own life. Now, you need to drive up to the house and tell them what happened. Again, something you're never prepared for as an educator. So we have this community, we had just finished homecoming, we, we had been in school for four weeks, and people said, you know, it's starting to get better. And then something happens. And it was February 14th, Valentine's Day of 2000, two of our students were brutally murdered at the Subway sandwich shop. And then, it was May 4th, a young man, Greg Barnes, he was in the classroom with Dave Sanders. He was administering first aid. He was trying to stop the bleeding. He was administering CPR. He took Dave Sanders' wallet out and showing him pictures of his grandkids to keep them alive until the paramedics got there. Unfortunately, Dave did not make it. So Greg returned to school. And if you looked at the kid, you would say, this kid had everything going for him. I mean, he was a straight-A student. 
He did extremely well in basketball. As a matter of fact, he was a junior who had already started getting scholarships to play after high school. The nicest kid you'd ever want to meet. Two weeks prior, he was at prom. On May 6th, his dad comes home. His dad was a probation officer. Dad comes home during lunch, raises the garage door, and breaks hanging from the rack. And he said, I can no longer live with these images. He said, all I can do, all I remember is Mr. Sanders, his shallow breathing. I remember the blood he's in from his body. And I can no longer live like this. And so we look, and that is so important in any of these situations that happen, reaching out to kids, making sure that you provide the support for the kids. So it was, you know, not only the impact of what happened on that day, but in the aftermath. I had a lot of support. I had my family, I had my friends, and I tell people today that I don't know if I could stay at Columbine for 15 years after the tragedy, because we're living in a different political climate right now. And I had a superintendent the very next day, I meet with him, and I meet with the superintendent and school board members, and I said, you know, it was my school, these kids lost their lives, I will resign. And the superintendent, excuse me, the school board member, John DeStefano said to me, he said, Frank, you're not going anywhere. You can stay as long as you want to stay. And I was 43 at the time, so I still had a good 10 to 15 years before I could even think about retiring. But he said, Frank, I know the kind of person you are. And even though he said this, he said, you had nothing to do with that, I felt the responsibility. But he did, he took a lot of grief that they felt that all the teachers should be removed from Columbine because they all had an impact on what happened at that school. And it started at the top with me. And in our society today, if something like that would happen, I really believe there'd be so much pressure put on superintendents and school board members, and that's why so many times you see these administrators leaving. But I gotta tell you, and I'm gonna tell you why I stayed, but it was difficult to return to that school each and every day and relive what I had experienced along with the teachers and students. So I had a lot of support. In the aftermath, and this was a question, it was real interesting, principal from Parkland said, we're concerned about losing teachers not coming back next year because the district said, if you don't feel too comfortable going back to Stoneman Douglas High School, we'll find another placing for you. And it was real interesting. The year after Columbine, we only had six staff members out of 150 who left. We had, uh, I think, four teachers and then two classified personnel leaving. And I think the reason is we all made a pact to stay until the last graduating, or the last class graduated in 2002. We felt this bond. And it was interesting. It was in 2002, we had over 50% of the staff leave. And it was tough. But a lot of them retired early, a lot went to other schools. And that's what they're worried about in Parkland, because it is tough. And I've talked to several teachers that every time they walk into that building, they have different emotions. And it's very difficult. And I, you know, I tell people, if people survive a catastrophe or people that survive 9-11, People that survive a car, if they can go back to the place where the accident occurred or the incident or the tragedy occurred, well, anyone that walked back to Columbine High School had to relive what they experienced that day. And they had to walk down hallways where they were escorted over dead bodies. And so it was very difficult for them. And talking to many of them, that year after, so many of us, we were really in a fog. It's real interesting, I was having this conversation last night with Ed Clark, a friend of ours. And one of the things that I'm really fighting for now with educators around the country, anytime a police officer is involved in a shooting, he or she has to debrief with someone to make sure they're doing all right. As educators, we don't do the same thing. And that worries me because Two weeks later, when we resumed classes, we put every teacher back in that classroom without them talking to anyone. And one of the things I'm really pushing for this, that for people that go through this really need to debrief to make sure, and it's not 
is a punitive type of thing. It's just to check in. For them to say, Frank, I think I'm really worried about so and so. We need to make sure that we provide the support that they need. And that's something I think is so important in the aftermath. I'm not doing a Wednesday or Tuesday night service, but I got to tell you, you may not go through a Columbine. You may not, and I hope no one does. And you may go through something more horrific, and it's really not a competition. But what I am going to urge you to do, no matter what you go through, you never have to travel that journey alone. And the reason I'm standing here today, and again, I am not here to convert anyone, but I gotta tell you, what helped me get through what I did and continue to be the principal was my faith. I'm a cradle Catholic, don't hold that against me. But I gotta tell you, the night that I'm sitting in my brother's house, and I don't know if you've ever been there, if you are a person of faith, and you start questioning your faith, I was there. And I'm saying, God, how could you allow this to happen? These poor, innocent kids were killed. And it was two days later, Father Ken Leone, who was a dear friend of mine, he called me down to the parish where I had been a member for over 20 years. There was about 1,200 people in the sacristy, and he brings me up on the altar, and we had a lot of our students who were part of the youth group come up, and they extended their hands over me, and they prayed for our community. And he whispered something in my ear, and he said, Frank, he said, at times we got to live by faith and not by sight. And he said, you were spared that day for a reason. Now, you need to go back and rebuild that community. I'm talking about feeling the pressure. And he said, you're not going to have to walk that journey alone. And he said, many times in our lives, he said, difficulties are really blessings in disguise. And so that gave me the motivation to go back. And he shared this with me. You know, and it's hard, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And I can remember, I told you what it was like on April 20th. It was a beautiful 70 degrees, blue, crystal blue sky day when everything happened. And from Wednesday up through Saturday or Friday, it started snowing for three straight days in Colorado. And that doesn't happen very often. And I didn't do any interviews with the media because I had so much on my mind, but finally the district said, Frank, you need to, they need to talk to you, you were the principal of the school. And I started my first interview at five o'clock in the morning because it was an, uh, I think it was today's show, Good Morning America. And the point of this is I'm sitting in this chair, it was, we were doing an interview outside, it was snowing, and I'm looking over at the school, and I saw a yellow crime tape around the building. It snowed glistening. And all I kept thinking is prior to, that day, we had sunshine and light, and we had so much in that community. And then we saw darkness descend upon us. And again, Father sent me this quote that helped me get through the difficult times. I don't know in your life if there's times things happen, you start throwing yourself a pity party. I was there. I said, you know, I'm a good person. I gave myself, you know, I got into education to help others. Why me? Out of all the schools, why me? And one of the things that changed my attitude is every Saturday, I would go to Craig Hospital. And it's a world-renowned hospital for spinal cord injuries and brain trauma. And the four students that I mentioned, Anne-Marie, Patrick, Sean, and Richard Cristaldo were there. And these kids, could not even put words together to make a sentence because of the injuries that they had suffered. Three of them, Pat, or excuse me, Patrick was partially par paralyzed on the right side, but he would walk, and he continues today to make improvements. But Sean Graves, Anne Marie Hallcalter, and Richard Costello, there was a good chance that they would lose the use of their lower body. And when I walked out of that hospital on Saturdays, I was no longer feeling sorry for myself because I saw the uphill battle for these kids and they were inspiration for me. And the first kid to lead us back into Columbine High School was Patrick Ireland. And if you would have saw him the first day I walked in that hospital to the first day, it was remarkable. But I want to share a story. We talk about Columbine and the tragedy that occurred Columbine also represents hope. And this is what I'm sharing with these principals who have recently gone through what they've gone through. 
John Gray's mom and dad were very concerned because Sean, there was a good chance he was never going to walk again because a bullet went through his backpack, through his spinal cord, and he had very limited feeling in his legs. But they were more concerned because he had given up the will to live. He was 14 years old being told there's a chance he'll never walk again. And they said, they, it was touch and go. And they said, Frank, maybe if you talk to him, and I can remember talking to Sean each Saturday. There were days he would not even roll over to look at me. And I would try to offer him encouragement, and I would bring some classmates in and say, Sean, you're such an inspiration for us. And you are going to be, we're going to be here to support you, but don't give up. And I said, don't deny your classmates, class of 2002, the opportunity to get your diploma. Sean, hang in there. Well, as time went on, Sean started to make some improvements. Still no movement in his lower body. He was homeschooled for a while, but he passed all of his classes. And we're getting ready for graduation, 2002, and we're at Fiddler's Green Amphitheater. About 10,000 people there. It was a beautiful Colorado morning. So they're getting ready to read the names, and Sean Graves is out on the stage area waiting to come on. So they read, you know, Sean, and I think his middle name was Robert Graves. Well, people just went crazy as far as yelling and screaming because of everything that he was able to overcome, and he was in his wheelchair. And all of a sudden, they're pushing him across, and before he got to me, he put his hand up and he got out of his wheelchair and walked to me. And he said, thanks for never giving up on me. Now I'm here to get my diploma. And that's what Columbine represents. Never giving up. And this kid is going out and talking to other communities where such events happen. Patrick Ireland is my financial advisor, and I am so glad he survived because things are going well. <laughs> it is this. And it's these kids that never gave up hope, and they taught us. And it was Patrick Ireland who said to me, he said, I'm not a victim, I'm a victor. And these are the stories that I want to leave with you. How do you keep the momentum going? It was tough. We talked about it. What do you do three years out, five years out, and we're still trying to help them? Talk about my faith. But the second or right up there with my faith was counseling. <coughs> I had a district employee tell me the day after, Frank, if you seek counseling, that's a sign of weakness. You better not tell anyone because they will deem you unfit for duty and you will lose your job. Now luckily, I'm full blood Italian, I don't listen to people when I, I believe something's not right. And the advice I took was from a Vietnam veteran, John Fisher, my mom worked for him, he was a chiropractor. He called me within 24 hours and he said, Frank, I never got the help I needed when I came back from Vietnam. He said, it cost me a marriage. He said, I've been in and out of businesses. I never got the help I needed. And I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And he said, Frank, you cannot help anyone else if you don't help yourself. Because he said, you're going to be pulled in so many different directions. You've got parents, you have the district, you have community that are looking to you. And you're going to find every reason to take care of everyone else and not take care of yourself. And he said, you better get in and talk to someone. And that was the smartest thing I ever did. And I got into counseling immediately. And I'm still in counseling today. I got my counselor on speed dial. This year, I've been back to see him twice. Every April, it's kind of like maintenance. Every April, I call to just check in. And it was real interesting, you know, with my counselor being able to talk to him. And, and next time you get on a plane, and I get an opportunity to fly a lot, and I think every time a flight attendant says, you know, not that we listen, but they're going over what you're supposed to do. But the one thing that resonates with me is they said, if you lose cabin pressure, there's going to be a mass that drops down. And before you help that person next to you, make sure you put it on yourself. And that's what this counseling is all about. And I truly, truly believe in my heart to heart, if I did not have my faith, I did not have the counseling, I would not have been able to fulfill what Father Ken had told me to rebuild that community. Same gentleman that said counseling is a sign of weakness. He said, Frank, you're a man. He said, men don't cry. He said, if you cry, they're going to think you're weak, and 
there is no way you're going to be able to lead that community. Now, I'm full blood Italian. I get emotional at the grand opening of a Walmart, <laughs> and people are telling me I can't cry. I mean, I'm 63 years old, and my mom yells at me. They're both my parents. I cry when my mom yells at me now. And so they're telling me you can't cry. Well, it's, uh, it's amazing. Sometimes you do things in your life and you don't even realize the unintended consequences. We could not go into Columbine because of all the damage that had been done to the school. And we were going to go to Chatfield High School, which was a high school about six, block, or six miles west of us. And they literally opened their doors, but more importantly, they opened their hearts to us. And we went to split session, so the Chatfield kids went to school from 7 until 11.30, and in Columbine, we would go from 1 until 6, because we still had about four weeks left of school. But one of the things that I asked our superintendent and school board to allow us to do is not resume classes for two weeks, because we had 13 memorial services we had to go to. And the last thing that I wanted our kids and staff members to do is have to go to a memorial service and then try to go to a math class or English class, so they did. But we also realized the importance of providing support for our kids and staff. With our staff members, we met each and every day. With our kids, we would have anywhere from 1,000 to 700, 700 to 1,000 kids show up and we provided support in different groups and activities for the kids. But it was on a Thursday, two days, and it was the afternoon before I went down to St. Francis. A counselor came up and they said, Frank, you need to come into the auditorium. The kids need to see you. And I said, I'm, I'm burned. I have nothing to give. I had not slept in two days. I had not eaten in two days. I was just rain. And they said, you need to come with us. So I walked through the back of the auditorium. All of a sudden, the kids stood up and they started cheering and yelling, we love you, Mr. D. You know, we're calling by Now, the purpose of this story, for two days, we had students that showed little or no emotion. We had especially guys that were very stoic because I'm sure they were being told, you've got to be tough. Well, when the kids started chanting that, and I come up on the stage, I lose it. I mean, I am crying uncontrollably. Well, all of a sudden, when I look out, I see everybody in the auditorium crying. And what the counselor said to me at that point, he said, Frank, you just granted everyone in that auditorium permission to cry. And he said, it's not anything that you said verbally, but your actions spoke more loudly than anything. And it allowed us to start to heal. And that's when I realized, so many times, it's not necessarily the words you speak, but it's the actions that follow. You know, and I could never go in to the auditorium and meet with my teacher saying, Man, you people are screwed up. You better go talk to someone. And you know what people are going to say. No one's going to tell me how to feel or what I'm going to do. But it's just the wording. When I walked in to the auditorium, I would start a conversation by saying, Boy, I don't know about you, but I'm not sleeping. Gosh, I'm not hungry. I wake up in the middle of the night when I do fall asleep. I don't know if this is going to help you or not, but I'm talking to a counselor. He's starting to give me some strategies. It's how you deliver the message. And it was the same thing with the kids that really helped us with that healing process. Something that we never learned as a principal, as teachers, is what do you do with kids who've been in a situation where they've been traumatized? We go back to Chatfield, the parents decide to put up an archway of balloons, blue and silver balloons, where the Columbine Rebels, that's our school colors. Great idea, until the balloons started popping literally saw kids diving on the ground. We would have kids running down to the main office at the door in the gymnasium or in their classroom shut. We could not serve Chinese food for over three years because that was a meal the kids were eating when the tragedy or when the shooting started. Teachers had to change the curriculum. They could not show a videotape or a, a CD or any sounds of gunfire. We had to change the plays and books had to be brought in to change the whole curriculum. And the thing that was interesting is when teachers went back in, and this is one of the things in working with some of the schools right now, they're saying these kids, they seem distant. But what they experienced over here at St. Mary's, what they experienced in Parkland is 
their brains are not working in the same manner they were prior to it. And so you've got to tell teachers these are some of the things that we have to do. We actually had teachers reading, sophomores and juniors, instead of having the kids read, the teachers were reading to them in order for them to comprehend. And so these are all things that you never think about prior to something like this happening. Then we had teachers. We could have a group in here that experienced the same thing, but they react differently. We had teachers and staff members that wanted to constantly talk about it. They wanted to journal. They wanted to express themselves. Then we had other teachers who said, the sooner I get back to teaching, the sooner I'm going to heal. And then we had some people in between. First day back at Chatfield High School, we decided that what we were going to do is we were going to do a big assembly, and I welcomed all the kids back and tried to offer support. We invited the parents back, because there was a lot of parents that were very anxious, a lot of kids that were very anxious. It was interesting. I had one of the toughest decisions to make. We got back into school, and the assembly seemed to be going all right, and we received a bomb threat. The superintendent comes up, and the police came up, and they said, Frank, what do you want? And I asked the police how viable. But there was so much going on, and I know talking to people at Parkland, all the threats are coming in and waiting, whether or not to take that threat seriously or not. And it was at that point that I really felt, and I would never do anything but put kids in harm's way, but we had a tough decision. And the law enforcement assured me that they didn't feel this viable threat, because I realized if we would have said we're canceling school today because of a bomb threat, we would have lost those kids for the rest of the year. And so those were tough decisions. But anyway, after the assembly, we were going to have our teachers and all our staff members meet with the kids that they were with when the tragedy happened. So for example, I was with the 30 girls. I had a math teacher, a dear friend of mine. Uh, we grew up together in North Denver. Taught algebra, just a great teacher. He walks into his ninth grade algebra class. The last time he saw the kids, they were running out towards the east hallway as shots were being fired. The first thing he says to the kid, where's your homework? Return in your homework. Kids are crying, parents are calling, saying, what are you, you're teachers, what's wrong with them? So I call him in my office and I said, Joe, well, we need to work on your empathy skills a little bit. <laughs> and he started crying. And he said, Frank, I can't talk about it because I'll never come back and teach. And that's when I realized that people were in different places. And that's the piece of advice that I'm sharing now. You have to have different activities to meet the different needs of people because one size does not fit all. And that's an important lesson that we learned. It's interesting. Um, if you've had anyone fight in wars and they come back, a lot of times they don't want to share their experience. I know I had uncles that served in the Korean War in World War II, and you ask them about it, they don't want to talk about it. Well, we saw something similar with our kids. They did not want to tell their parents what they experienced. As a matter of fact, they didn't want to be at home. It's not that they did not love their parents, but they, I think they were protecting their parents. And they would, our churches, the interfaith community opened their doors to them, rec centers opened their doors. But I had parents come up and say, Frank, even though our kids did not die that day, we lost our kids. Because they were telling me that their friends were telling them that your son was in the freezer hiding, or they were in this uh, little storage room. And they said, Frank, you have a pretty good report with the kids, can you talk to them? So I brought them into the auditorium, and I said, this is not going to make sense until you become parents. And I said, this better not happen anytime soon. But I said, when your parents heard that shots were being fired at Columbine High School, their hearts started pounding because they weren't sure if they were ever going to see you again. And I said, you need to go home and you need to love your parents and hug your parents because you don't realize it right now. You need them and they need you. I didn't realize the importance of that statement until about three or four years ago when I had some kids come up to me I call them kids, they're 36 year old adults. And they waited to have kids. But they came in and they said, Mr. D, 
we're having a hard time sending our kids to a public school because they have their own kid. And they said, are there any assurance that what happened to those kids at Columbine can happen to my son or daughter? And it's very difficult. And so things that happen, it weighs out. And now, even though it's 19 years later, they're in a different role. This is tough. I told you what Patrick Ireland told me. He said, I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. And he said, Mr. D, I realized that I could never start healing until I learned forgiveness. Now here's a kid who was shot, was unconscious for two and a half hours as he dragged himself from this chair to the back of that room and lowered himself down to paramedics. And I had so much hatred built up in my heart towards those two killers because I saw what they did. I saw the lives that they had changed. But I also realized if I was going to continue to be principal, I couldn't bring that hatred into that school every day. I was angry. And a friend of mine said, he sent me something, and he said, you know, Frank, you can hate the sin, but not the sinners. And I had to forgive. And I got to tell you, it was tough. And there are families who have lost their kids. Columbine, there are families whose kids were injured, they can never forgive, and I would never judge them on that. But for me to heal, I had to be able to forgive. And that allowed me to walk into that building to continue to lead them, and that's a tough one. You know, one of the most difficult things, and I don't know, in your lives, did you ever have to make a choice? I mean, you're doing something for police officers, it may be the police officer that walks the street, boots on the ground, or teachers, you know, you love teaching, but then you get those opportunities to become a teacher or become an administrator over the other side, the dark side, so to speak. <laughs> those are tough. And for me, I love teaching. And when someone, I had an opportunity because we knew there were going to be some openings in administration, it was tough. And I said, my biggest concern, and I'm sure looking at the superintendents and other people up there, you always worry each time that you move yourself from one layer from the classroom to the principal to a little further removed from the kid. And if you go to central administration, you may not have as many opportunities. And, you know, I talk to police officers and say, when I come up here, I miss being on the streets. Well, that was for me. And I had a dear friend of mine who said, Frank, your position is changing, but you don't have to change as a person. And that made so much sense because they said instead of dealing with 150 students in your social studies classes, you'll have an opportunity to work with 2,000 students. Instead of dealing with 12 staff members in social studies, you'll have an opportunity to work with 150 staff members. And it really helped them. You know, what becomes a true leader? And you know, one of the things that I really worry about now, and I don't know if this is just a Colorado thing, but I worry about overprotective parents. And what I see so many times is parents will not allow their kids to fail. And this is not criticizing parents. But I look at my own life, I made mistakes. I went to a parochial school and if you messed up with the nuns, when you got home, you were in trouble. But the point being, as I, my career went on, I worry about some of our kids because no matter what they did, their parents would defend them. I had a kid, great kid, he got accepted into a prestigious school. I knew the parents. He got caught cheating on his senior paper. And he did such a poor job of plagiarizing, I wanted to extend the suspension. I mean, I'm saying, if you're going to cheat, I mean, you did a poor job. Well, the parents come in and they said, Frank, we want, him. We want you to meet with our son. We want the teacher there. And I said, yeah, no problem. So I'm anticipating. So they walk in, the son walks in, and he's kind of curiously looking down. His mom and dad walks in, and the father says, Frank, you know how you're here? And I'm saying, yeah. All of a sudden, he starts pointing in the chest. And he said, you're the reason he cheated. And I said, this conversation isn't going how I planned. He said, if you didn't establish a high standard in your school, you are forcing these kids to cheat. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. And all I kept thinking 
is I have them for four more weeks, you've got them for the rest of your life. And I worry about these kids because what's going to happen if they get their first B when they go to college? What happens if they don't get that job they applied for? What happens if they don't get that perfect evaluation on their job? Can they handle it? And as parents, you've got to love your kids through the good times and the bad, but you've got to allow them to fail and be there for support. Because I don't know if anyone in here has been through life and never failed. And someone once told me, and this makes so much sense, in our society today, our kids are facing a mountain to climb, and what we want to do as adults or parents is move the mountain as opposed to giving them the skills to climb the mountain. And I think that is so important that you're going to love the kids. And my parents always said, we're going to make it easier for you. But my parents also talk, talk to me about every choice you make, there's a consequence. Leadership, you know, people ask me what kind of leader was I before Columbine? It was the same leader after. I can remember doing an assembly. Um, we had our prom assembly. And I had flashbacks to my prom assembly when I drove up and I saw that car that was wrecked out there and I'm sure it had something to do with drinking and driving and things of that nature. Well, we would always have that assembly and I can remember it was a Friday before the Columbine tragedy. The kids are there, I was always the last one to speak, and my biggest concern as a high school principal, as most are, is the choices that kids make on prom weekend. And you talk to them about, you know, gosh, number one, it's illegal to drink at that age, but please be smart. And I can remember having the kids close their eyes and I shared some vulnerable moments in my life where I lost a friend because of an unwise choice and kids had lost their lives and I had them close their eyes and I said, you're a valued member of the Columbine community, or Columbine family, and you're, a, you know, we all care about you. And I said, I want you to think about this for a second. Think about what it'll be when you open your eyes and that person that's sitting next to you is not next to you next week because of an unwise choice you made. And I told them how much I loved each and every one of them. Now that was on Friday, we had prom on Saturday, and then on the 20th, the shootings happened at Columbine. And I had to go back and tell those kids the same thing, how much I cared about them. And so people, I think what allowed me to stay for so long is the tradition or the relationships that I had established the previous 20 years. You know, if I was doing a thing and if this was all school administrators, I could spend an entire evening talking about leadership. But there are some things that I do want to talk about. I learned this from my parents. You treat people the way you want to be treated. In all my years as principal, I don't think I ever had to tell anyone, you will do it because I'm your boss. I don't think I ever had to tell a kid, you will do it because I'm your principal. And I'm sure people are going to say, gosh, I would have loved to work for him. He was a pushover. It was all about respect. And even when I had to suspend kids, they knew I cared about them. I would call them to check in. And when they came back, I'd make sure they were doing all right. We had teachers and we butted heads. But when they left, if they knew it was over something that they did. It, and I was not personally attacking them. And it was the little things that make a big difference. It was my first year as principal. I decided I was going to give a holiday or Christmas card to every staff member. So I had 150. I'm a pretty type A person. So I counted the number of days from Thanksgiving to the winter break. And so I wrote five cards a day. And the reason I did that is I wanted to personalize each card. But what it also allowed me to do is go meet with teachers informally just to talk to them. So when I wrote those cards, how's your dad doing? I heard he just had, you know, heart surgery. Or congratulations on being a grandparent for the first time. And the first year I did it, everybody was comparing cards to see if I wrote the same thing. And when they realized I didn't, I didn't realize the importance of that card. They were in their classrooms, they were in their office. And it was really funny, the following year, I went back to Columbine's graduation. I had staff members come up and they said, Frank, you know what we miss about you? And I'm thinking, you know, my motivational speeches, you know, my leaps. They said, no, those cards. <laughs> and I realized how important the little things. And right now in our society, we are so technology-driven. Text, text, text. But 
the little things that make a big difference. I used to tell teachers, call parents when kids do something well. Because most of the time, the only time teachers call parents is when their kids mess up. And parents are sort of saying, what? You know, your kid did a great job on this. Same thing, walking by the hallway, I go up to the teacher saying, gosh, I am so glad you were at that school play the other night. I know how greatly the kids appreciate that. I know your schedule's building or busy. Little things make a big difference. You know, and again, getting into leadership, and think of the people that you work with. The difference between a boss and a leader. I had an opportunity to do a presentation up at Soka University up in um, Laguna Beach, California, and there was a young man, he was a graduate student, and he said, these are the things that I learned from your two-day workshop. And he called them Mr. D's B's, and I looked at these, whether you're a parent, whether you're a student, whether you're an administrator, a teacher, these are good things in life. The visibility piece. You know, how many times I think in our society, and I grew up, I'm a baby boomer. My mom was home every day I got home from school. The times have changed. That visibility piece is so important. Empathetic. Number five, guys, that's for us. We are not good listeners. I got in an argument with my wife this week. She said, Frank, she came home and she wanted to talk about her job. And she is venting. Within two minutes, I'm telling her what she needs to do to fix the problem. And she said, Frank, I don't need you to fix the problem. I just need you to listen. And as guys, we feel we need to fix everything. And how many times do we do that with our own employees? A teacher comes in and wants to just talk and vent and within a minute, well, this is what you need to do, and this is what you need to do, and you need to do, and they're finally saying, thanks or nothing. So that listening piece is so important. Communication, communication, communication. I love this. Sorry, I tell you, treat people. It's all about respect. And if you can think how you would want to be treated, and how many times have you been called in and someone starts yelling at you and screaming at you, and right away you get defensive? And so it's the same with people. Things were out of control. I was named in eight lawsuits. It was real interesting. People said, don't take it personally. But when you're being served with papers, you kind of take it personally. But I also realized none of the families who lost their kids by the loss, it was the people, parents who kids were injured, and I can understand why. Because of the uncertainty of the future. They weren't sure about the medical bills, and they weren't sure of this, and it was part of it. It, it made it very difficult. And this is the one piece of advice that I've given to the three schools that, I, that I've worked with this year in the schools when I worked with uh, Sandy Hook and Virginia Tech and some of the other, you almost need two principals. And at Columbine, we were so fortunate because they brought a retired principal in who worked with the aftermath of Columbine. We were inundated with so much stuff. But I felt if I was the only one there, I would be consumed with that. And what I felt our school needed was for me to be running the school visibility piece, because I needed to be in the hallways, I needed to be in classrooms, and that was important. And so that's the advice, and in most of these schools, they are bringing additional help for the principals that are dealing with situations such as Columbine and Parkland and some of the other places. And it was a tough road. People, I truly believe the reason that we're still talking about Columbine today is because of the way it was played out in the media. There's been a lot of school shootings since Columbine. There were school shootings before Pearl, Mississippi, Jonesboro, Paducah, uh, Heath High School. Well, since that time, there have been a lot. But think about the shootings in Parker. The first comparison they made was Columbine High School. And it was a tough road. Every move we made was under a microscope. 
You know, one of the things that I worry about, and I shared this with the principals in other communities, we talk about getting help that is considered healthy help, whether it be faith, whether it be counseling, but there are a lot of people that turn to drugs and alcohol to cope with their problems. And I know a lot of times when I'm working with law enforcement, it's prevalent there where they see things on a daily basis that we had to witness one day. We saw kids who said they're going to live risky behavior because they said there's no guarantees in life. They said, I just buried three of my best friends and so we're going to live life to the fullest and it scared us. I just had a conversation with one of the students from Parkland and he called me and said, Mr. D, I'm really concerned because all of a sudden, we're going to be leaving for the summer, and I worry about some of my friends and where they're headed. And so I make sure when I'm talking with the principal and I'm working with the mayor there to make sure that there's support for these kids during the summer. And that's so important, that support system. We talk about the media, and one of the things that I've learned is the media is never going to let the truth get in the way of their story. And I also realize that if they have a slant to a story, you can do an interview for three hours, and they'll pick and choose what they're going to use. And you'll say, I never said that. I really did. You know, and it's really interesting, uh, that whole concept. So what I realized is I'm going to talk to the media, and I would interview, but I also use them to say, I want you to start helping with healing and talking about some of the good things that we're doing at Columbine. Surround yourself with a good team, and that is so important. I think the thing that made me feel good when I was getting ready to retire is when the teacher said, Frank, we always knew that you would run through a wall for us and we would do the same for you. And that you were never one of them, not only one of them, I'm sure they were referring to administrators, but they said you never forgot what it was like to be a teacher. And it was building those relationships. And I can send these slides to others if you want to just let me know. Whoops. You know, standing alone, and I think back, um, it was a real interesting day. I had a chance to spend time over in Annapolis and just looking at all the history and things. And I look at some of the great leaders in our history, and I think of Abraham Lincoln, how he was able to keep this country together. And I had a chance to meet with Mayor Giuliani after 9-11 shared some of our thoughts and he said, you know, I learned a lot. I'm saying, what could you possibly learn from me? And he said, I learned that you can wear your emotions on your sleeve and it's all right. And he said, I saw how, you know, you were very emotional. And he said, I learned that that's all right. It's all right to cry. And he said, I tried to attend as many memorial services as the fallen officers as possible. And he said, I ended up walking eight or nine women down the aisle because their fathers were killed on that horrific day, 9-11. Forever changed, and I just want to read it quite small. April 20th, a day in which my life changed forever, a day in which the lives of the members of our society changed forever, a day in which our world witnessed our vulnerability, a day in which the value for human life was destroyed. World peace was compromised, and I became a member of a club that no one wants to join. And it's real interesting, and I keep referring back to the three shootings this year. In years past, I've always reached out, but a lot of people would not reach out until many months later. The three principals from these schools have reached out to me within the first week. And it's not that I'm an expert, but when I say to them, I know what you're feeling, there's some buy-in there. It's about attitude. Our lives are not determined by what happens to us, but determined by how we respond. And it's all about attitude. One of the things that I worried the most about is if I allowed negativity to get me down, I may never get back up. Do you work with people or are you surround or you around people that are negative? And you don't have to point them out today, but it's toxic. Think about it, when you walk and you're having a great day and all of a sudden you walk in and you're in a good mood and they just bring you down. And I couldn't allow that to happen and I wasn't disrespectful, but I really felt a need to be positive. 
You know, it's not a faster how high you climb, it's how well you bounce. You know, as I stated, okay, this is a different presentation, but I'll get to it. There we go. Different. People are in different places when I talk about it. And one of the things, the young man over here, and I, sorry my laser isn't working here. The young man in colored shirts, this was a 10 year reunion for the class of 2002. That's Craig Scott. Craig Scott's sister, Rachel, was the first one who lost her life at Columbine. And he really struggled because on the morning of the shooting, he got in an argument with his sister, his older sister, and she kicked him out of the car. That was the last conversation he had. In addition to that, he was in the library where he was hiding under a table where two of the kids he was with under the table died. And we were really worried about him, and his parents were worried about him, and he has turned his life in honor of his sister, and if any of you get a chance to bring Rachel Scott to your school, Rachel's challenge, it's fantastic, and Craig is doing that along with his dad. You know, the wall, people said, Frank, how could you continue to look at those pictures day in and day out? And that's the reason I walked in back into that building for those kids. And I made a statement one time, when someone you love becomes a memory, the memory becomes a treasure. There were a lot of costs. I've been in six different car accidents in the month of April. So if you're ever in Colorado and you see a blue Santa Fe, go the other way, that's me. <laughs> There's no guarantees. You know, I told you, I've talked to my counselor several times this year. You know, I can't tell you the number of times I went to the hospital thinking I was having a heart attack and it was actually anxiety. And I could tell the uh, doctor, I apologize. I said, don't, the first time you think it's an anxiety attack, you could be having a heart attack. This, again, is not say, oh, poor Frank. It's more to hopefully learn from some of my mistakes. I told you I did a pretty good job of taking care of myself. I went and got the help I needed. If I had to do it all over again, I would have did the same thing with my wife of 18 years. Because when I said, she couldn't understand, she said, you changed. Yeah, I did. And when I said, if you come with me to the counseling, or counseling, you'll understand. Well, she said, I'm not the one screwed up, you are. And she kept saying, when are you going to get over this calling like thing? And it wasn't. She didn't know how to deal with it. This impacted our whole family. And every day, when we come home, she said, oh, guess what we're going to talk about, kids? We're going to talk about Columbine. Let's talk about Dad and Columbine. Columbine, Columbine. Well, it got to the point, that's not what I needed or wanted to hear. And so being the smart man, I was, I'd get home after she was sleeping, and I'd leave before she woke up. Guess how that turned out? It's called divorce. And I look back on it, and no one was at fault. We did the best of what we had to do. But the, what I reach out is make sure that your family is always also affected by that. On that day, they weren't sure if I was alive or dead. They weren't sure if they lost their husband or if my kids lost their father. But the thing that has hurt me, and I, this is something I am going to work on until the day I die is with my daughter Haley. Haley was a sophomore at the time at Thunder Ridge High School. One night I come home and she's waiting up in the family room and she's crying. And she said, Daddy, you didn't die that day, but I lost my daddy. And she said, you always told me that I was always going to be daddy's little girl, but I'm not. All those kids from Columbine are your kids. Because I see how they come up to you and you hold them and you hug them. But what about me? I'm your daughter. And that's one of those things that I should have taken her with me to counseling. Things were going all right for about the next 15 years until one day she calls and I said, Haley, how you doing, honey? She said, you're not my dad, you're Frank. We haven't talked in five years. I got a grandchild that I haven't seen. And I'm going to continue because I can't imagine what I did to her to hurt her. But there is, I did get a text from her. It was really interesting. It was a week of the anniversary. She texted me. 
that she talked about forgiveness. And so we're going to try to reconcile that. But a decision that I made 19 years ago came back. And it's something that I share with you to make sure that you're not the only one affected by it, your loved ones and family members. Now, the one good thing is I ended up reconnecting with my high school sweetheart. We've been together 16 years. And you're going to see pictures of my granddaughter and my wife's side. So, many causes, people ask, you know, what caused these two? And I think the book Columbine really does a pretty good job of explaining. And there's a lot of to do's. In Colorado, we have Safe to Tell, which is an anonymous tip line 24 7. And so you need to empower kids to have methods. And one of the things I really worry about today is the role that social media plays in our kids' lives. And as educators here or parents, you need to find out about what your kids are doing on their phones. When you think they're going to bed at night, and if they have their phones with them in their rooms, there's a good chance they're on their phones. And what impact does that have? I was at a parent meeting and a guy stood up and he said, I'm telling parents right now, when your kids go to bed at night, take their phones from them and have them charge them in your bedroom. And the kids were upset because they were going to lose their phones for that six hours. But those kids would have an opportunity to go to sleep. But social media is so much different now than what it was at Columbine for the good and the bad. And as I stated earlier, we used to do fire drills. Well, now we do lockdown, lockout. And I work with the I Love You Guys Foundation. People ask why I waited 15 years to retire. Originally, I was going to retire, or not retire, but move on after three. But I felt I didn't rebuild the community enough. So then I made a decision to stay until every kid who was in an elementary school graduated. And that was a class of 2012. So I'm getting ready to re or retire in 2012. And a parent comes up and says, Frank, you can't retire. And I said, no, I made a promise until the last three kids uh, gra graduated from preschool. And they said, no, you don't understand. My kid was in the first year of a two-year preschool program, so you need to stay a couple more years. So <laughs> I stayed through 2015. You know, many acts of kindness. If you ever get a chance to go to the Smithsonian, they have the Holocaust Museum there. This lady is Gerda Weisman Klein. Dear friend of mine, she's 93 years old. She's living in Phoenix, Arizona. And she came to Columbine six months after the tragedy, or excuse me, nine months after the tragedy, January 20th. And she told our kids, I was 15 years old when I was abducted. I lost my parents, I lost my brother, I lost a dear friend. When they liberated me, the American GI liberated me, I was 70 pounds, and I had wide hair from malnutrition. But there was good things to come out of it. She said, the man, the GI who liberated me, he's now my husband. He married her, and they got a video about her, and she's got a book, and she won an Academy Award, or an HBO and Emmy Award for her book, All But My Life. And the thing that stands out is this is what she told our kids, and I truly believe as Columbine community, we were able to turn pain into healing, ignorance into enlightenment, into enlightenment, hatred into love. And we taught our kids how to give and receive. We did a uh, motorcycle rally. We had a young lady, um, Emily Keys, who was killed up at Black Canyon High School. And each year we did a motorcycle rally that we raised money for her father and mother, the I Love You Guys Foundation, and now he goes around the country doing emergency planning. What I want to end with, because we started late, and I know it's getting late, but what I want to talk about is it's so important. It's called about creating that welcoming, creative environment. And I'll tell you, in a large high school, I was pretty naive because I'd walk down the hallway and kids would fist bump me and they'd say, you know, we're calling by more family. And I assumed that's how everyone felt in that school. But I was wrong. When I became a better principal is when I walked outside and smoking, kids were smoking cigarettes. Or I walked over to the skate park and they're on their boards and they're not attending classes. I walked over to the food court and I said, guys, what are you doing? And they said, you even know who we are. And luckily I knew most of their names, but they said, 
you know, there's kids in your school that care less if we ever walk through those doors again. We don't fit into that column line family crap you're telling us. And it broke my heart because they were my kids and I let them down. And I told them, I said, I want you to get all the friends that feel the same way you do. We're going to meet in the auditorium before Thanksgiving. So I met and they blasted me, justifiably so. That's not what I wanted to hear, but what I needed to hear. So I told them, I said, I need for you to come to the next assembly. And they said, why would we come to any of the assemblies at Columbine High School? You recognize the students, you recognize the athletes, you recognize all the kids at the performing arts. Where do I fit in? That's a waste of time. We're invisible in your school. And I said, you need to trust me and come to the next assembly. Half these kids didn't even know where the gym was because they were never at an assembly. So I said, I better come up with a plan. And I used to tell teachers this after that experience, they don't know how much you know until they know how much you care. And these kids need to know that you care about them when you're not, they're not part of your English class, that you care about them when they're gonna graduate. You know, as educators, you didn't get an education to make money. But when you see a kid after they graduate, they come up and tell you they made a difference in your life. When you get invited to a kid's wedding, every year I get invited to eight or nine weddings of former students because they said thanks for being in my life. And that's something you can't put a price tag on. Those are the things that make you get into education. We had to change the culture. We had to get people to trust and believe. And we did an activity at Columbine. It was Across the line, and we had teachers recommend kids, kids that were, you know, did extremely well in classes, kids that were athletes, and we had kids that were kind of on the edge, and we brought them into the gymnasium, and they're kind of looking at each other saying, why are we here? We have nothing in common. These people, we don't know them, we don't want to know them, until we did an activity called Cross the Line, and it was sponsored by MTV. All of a sudden, they lined everybody up on one side of the half court line and they said we had teachers in there and I participated and they said how many of you have ever been verbally abused by a parent across the line and all of a sudden kids started crossing the line and they're looking at this person who they perceive to have everything going for them we saw some barriers breaking down and then they said how many of you have grown up in a hole in which alcohol has been abused and these kids that are driving the nice cars, these kids that are going to college, they're standing next to kids that they don't even know if they're gonna graduate. It started changing, and the thing that opened the eyes of so many is when they said, how many of you have ever thought of taking your own life? And over 80% of the people standing there, which included adults, crossed that line. And by the end, these kids that never made eye contact with each other were hugging each other. And they realize that many times perception is not reality. And it changed the attitude of our school. Rebels with the cause. And I want to get to one last video. And then, well, that, we'll talk about that. We won a state championship in football. And I told the kids they could throw me up in the air. But I also realized they could have dropped me. So luckily, it went well. One of the things, sorry, I told you about that special assembly that I needed to do something to have an impact. So I came up with these carabiners and it said, we are Columbine. And I would recommend anyone that wants to use this, please feel free to do it. As a matter of fact, I've been working with Parkland, Florida. They're gonna use this for their graduation. We give every kid a link. Because I said, you want to connect? These kids are really concerned once they graduate. And I said, give them a link. That they'll always be connected, and they're going to use that. But what we did, when all these kids walked in, those kids that were at the smoking pit walked into the gymnasium for the first time, I gave everyone a link. And so it was my turn to talk to the kids. And I said, each of you represent a link in Columbine High School. They're all individuals. You're like a snowflake. Each one is different. 
And I said, that's what makes Columbine special. And you are students that excel in the classroom, others that excel in different areas, but you're all a part of the school. But I said, what really starts making us even stronger is Columbine. What starts to make us become family is when you take 400 links for the class of 2012. And now you become stronger because you are connected to someone. But I said, what's really going to make us better as a school, as we move forward, when we take 1,700 links and we come together as students, as parents, as community members, as teachers. So I put on the song, We Are Family. And I said, by the conclusion of this song, we're going to figure out a way for us to be better. So the song comes on and I said, please make this work. The song ends and all of a sudden we're in the gymnasium, two sides of the bleachers, they're connected and they have that chain and they're chanting, we are calling by. And I said, from this day forward, I'm going to put that chain up and if you ever come to Columbine and I invite you to come, I'll give you a tour. We still have that chain up there and I said, there's going to be days that you, you know, you may have failed a test or fighting with your parents, boyfriend, girlfriend. Remember that you're always connected to someone here at school. And when the seniors graduated, I gave them a link stating, even though you're graduating from Columbine, you'll always be a part of our family. And I'm amazed when I'm out and about. I see kids that graduated 10 years ago that hold up that link saying, we're Columbine. It had a major impact. Well, this young man, Kevin Yagavani, he was a kid that had nine different principles because he had nine different families, foster families. It started out before he went to the foster care. His mom and dad gave him to his grandparents who came to his aunt and uncle and finally ended up in the system. When he came to Columbine, and one of the things that I tried to do is meet with every kid who was not part of the Columbine Elementary School or Middle School because they're in the school of 2000, they don't have a lot of friends. I called him in within five minutes, he has me in tears because he told me a story. And he said, I know that I will always have someone to talk to because I know where your office is and thank you for caring about me. I didn't realize the impact that Columbine High School had on him until my last day, doing my last assembly and I knew what I was going to do, but I wasn't sure what I was going to say. Kevin Yagabani put a letter in my mailbox couple of hours before I'm getting ready to do my last assembly. I saw that letter and I just looked up and said thank you. Because now I know the message that I want these kids to remember as I leave left home. I'm hoping this video plays. Now comes the moment 18 years in the making. When he first became principal, he promised himself he would find a way to fly at his final assembly. He's also afraid of heights. You're going to face many fears in your life, and you got to believe. Believe in that link. And things happen in our lives that we can't explain, but I want to read you something. Kevin Yagavani transferred here. He never got his link. It says, Dear Mr. DeAngelis, the acceptance and family atmosphere that you helped create here at Columbine has really grounded my life. It's helped me create friendships that I will always remember. Thank you for being such a great principal and instilling the best school-wide atmosphere I've ever had. At this time, I want Kevin Dagavani to come down so I can present him with the Columbine link. see that when he returned and they were hugging him and there were tears and that's the atmosphere I wanted to create, that caring atmosphere. Good morning, Reverend Mr. D. And I just want to take this opportunity, it's the last time, I want to get a chance to address you and know that even though I'm not going to be your principal, you're still going to be my kid. Yeah, I mean, there's no way you say goodbye to that, that high school. We know you'll be back. May 28th, 2014. Thanks. And that's Chris Gifford, the teacher I was telling you about. What's up, Mr. D? How are you doing, sir? Good. What do you got going? I think Frank 
I mean, I, I don't know what else to say except I couldn't be more proud of me. In all of his time. Kevin, thanks, buddy. You know, I'm going to use your letter whenever I go speak. And yeah, that's really important. Thank you. Thank you. DeAngelis has learned some words are priceless. Love you, Mr. D. Love you too, buddy. Some words say it all. Good luck. Thank you for being more of a father to me than my dad ever was. I see students, the Lauren Townsend playing volleyball, I see the Rachel Scotts on stage, I see the Danny Rohrbach is a freshman, just being a freshman and hanging out with his friends and the Isaiah Schultz high-fiving me and I see Danny Mauser down at church and Kelly Fleming down at church on Sundays and, and it goes on and on in the Kyle Velasquez in the library and now instead of envisioning them laying in a pool of blood, I envision them living their lives, and that's the thing that kept me going. Bye guys, see you soon. Love you too, guys. Leaving a link to last a lifetime. The one thing that I can say, whether it was teaching, coaching, being a principal, I gave it my best. I had an opportunity to carry the Olympic torch 2002 Olympics, and I kept thinking back when doing that, leave a legacy and make a difference. And I need to applaud Dino and his staff for all that we're doing here to bring people together. Because people ask me, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? It's all of our kids. And to be in an auditorium where we have parents, we have administrators, we have teachers, we have kids, that's the chance. That's what, the only chance that we have. And the people from Parkland, Florida are stating never again. Enough is enough. And that's what we have to do. You know, it was Martin Luther King Jr. who had a dream. And I guess, what is your dream for this community? What do you want to see? You know, next year, three years, five years, what do you want to see for your kids and grandkids? And I know, you know, there's a Chinese proverb that states, when planting for a year, plant corn. When planting for 10 years, plant a tree. When planting for a lifetime, educate and train. And that's what we're going to continue to do. And I told you at the beginning of this presentation, I'm doing it in memory of the 13, but there's another reason. This is my little granddaughter, Mia Isabella. She's four and a half years old. And every weekend I get to spend time with her. And she is my special little girl. And I'm looking so forward after this week, I get to spend the entire weekend with her. And she's got me wrapped around her finger. But every time I'm with her, I make her a promise that I never want her to go through what those poor little kids did at Sandy Hook, as they were trapped in a classroom where were nowhere to go. Their lives ended at the age of six. I don't want her to be hiding under tables like the kids were at Columbine High School, being asked if they believed in God or if they want to live or die. And I don't want her to be running across the campus like they did at Virginia Tech. And I am going to do everything in my power as long as I can walk and talk to save these kids. Because our kids are our most precious commodity. And even if my parents had to bury me, and I'm 63 and my parents are in their 80s, they would struggle. Because that's not how life plays out. So I am so appreciative of you being here. Because we truly can make a difference. It's my honor and privilege, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank everybody for being here tonight. We have a collective group, and it was great to see. This was the first evening session 
we may have to do. Um, when we get to the parents, when we get to the emergency service providers who work during the day, and we couldn't, we couldn't attend Mr. DeAngelis' talks in the, in the past we, we sponsored. So, most of you know who I am from around town and everything else. Stop me if you need to, want to see any other type of stuff for us. You want a hand, your school systems are, are in touch with us all the time. Uh, we even have a weekly conference call every Monday to touch base with all the school systems. So, if they're doing what they need to do, trust me. Uh, we're there to help them, and it's with great friends like this that we're able to do it. Thank you again, Frank. Thank you.